Welcome to Worship with the United Methodist Church of Antioch. I am Pastor Katie, and it is my honor and delight to welcome you to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in this uh, communal but distant way. We are glad that we can gather together. I do have uh, some announcements this morning. So uh, we want to thank everyone who helped to make our pads collection a success last week. We are grateful for, for those who participated. And if you missed it and you're like, oh, I forgot, don't worry. You will have an opportunity to help again next month. We will be doing a monthly pads collection. Uh, so just watch for, for the more information coming that way. Uh, this morning, um, October 4th, uh, we want to remind you that there will be a drive-through communion opportunity from 10 to 10.30. Uh, so um, if you are interested in participating in communion in that way, you're invited to drive into the, uh, the back entrance of the church parking lot, drive up to the education wing, and then exit uh, out to um, either Main Street or um, a different exit out the, the back parking lot that way. Please don't hit anyone. Um, but communion will be served. You will receive the bread in a cup and the juice in a cup uh, served to, to your car. Um, so please bring everyone who will be uh, participating in the sacrament with you uh, because those cups have no lids those cups that we have, have used in the sanctuary many times over. So I just wanted to make, uh, make you aware of that. Um, a reminder that today is also World Communion Sunday, and if you uh, have the opportunity to share um, uh, even just a small offering to participate in that, uh, that offering for our denomination, um, half of the proceeds from the offering um, are administered by the General Board of Global Ministries um, and go to equip racial and ethnic minority students um, in the United States and international students uh, for scholarships. And so the other half is used for the Ethnic Scholarship Program and the Ethnic In-Service Training Program, uh, which are administered, administered by the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry. And we've got another video to show you about that program this week. to tell you about an opportunity to participate in something that you don't normally get to participate in. Uh, last year at annual conference, it was approved uh, that our conference would have three strategic goals, and those would be growing and reaching new disciples for Jesus Christ, living out the conviction that racism is incompatible with Christian teaching, and increasing the number of highly vital congregations. This year with the annual conference session going virtual, the Bible, stu Bible study sessions are open to everyone to participate, whether you are a member of the annual conference, the lay member from, who goes from the church or not. And so the last two sessions will be October 8th and October 22nd, both at 10 o'clock in the morning via Zoom. You will need to register to attend, but they are free and open to anyone. So you can check out um, more information and the link to register at www.umcnic.org slash AC2020. And that link is in the bulletin uh, that is on, the, on our church's website uh, for today's worship service. So consider joining in that opportunity that you don't normally get to participate in because not everybody goes to annual conference. So check those out if you can. Uh, this year, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Crop Walk is move, moving to a virtual opportunity. Uh, it will be October 25th, so check out that opportunity. Uh, the 
website to sign up is also in this same bulletin that you can download on our church's website. Walt would much rather be the one making this announcement, I'm sure, but uh, he's got any help that you, he would, he would give you any help you need, either getting signed up or donating to whichever it, walker is your favorite walker. So check that out. Um, it's still going to happen. We still need to raise money. People are still hungry, both locally and globally. So please, uh, please support the walkers uh, in, that you know and love in this church. There are plenty of them who are already signed up, I know. And um, I know if you are interested in walking, please go ahead and, and still sign up. There's, there's ways to do that. So check out all of these opportunities to serve, to, uh, to help our world and help those in need. And with that, I'm going to ask Heidi to lead us in worship this morning. The mission of the United Methodist Church of Antioch is to grow in faith, to worship God following the teachings of Jesus Christ, and to be instruments of God's love through the Holy Spirit as we reach out to our community and the world. One fifty seven, Jesus shall reign. Let 
we are welcomed to worship. We come to worship the God who calls us forward to the future. But we like the past. Nostalgia can give us warm, fuzzy feelings that may make us think the past is the best place to be. The Holy Spirit is always moving us forward. We don't even get to stand still. What if we need to rest? What if sitting down would be best for our spirit right now? Jesus took some time away to pray, so yes, there is absolutely space for that. But when we are rested, it is time to get up and move forward. Okay then, with God's guidance, Jesus' power, and the presence of the Holy Spirit, we will go where we are directed. Let us pray. Coming together to hear and learn from your word keeps us looking forward, Lord. As we try to put this last week behind us, there is so much we want to overthink. Things went wrong, people hurt us, we hurt others. We need to ask them for forgiveness. You know you were there. Use this time of worship to help us focus on you and how you would have us move forward from all of these things instead of have them hinder us. And now, O oh God, hear us as we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you again this week. Hope you've been doing well. So, Say you're gonna go on a trip. What are some things you might pack? Hmm. Well, let's see here. So you might wanna pack some shoes, right? In case you can do some walking, right? And maybe, you know, you don't wanna have bad breaths, so you're gonna brush a toothbrush, that sounds good. And I don't know, maybe you wanna bring um, a stuffed llama, cause you never know. You never know, really, you never know, right? So bring stuff, Llama. What about some other things you don't think about too often? What are some other things we can pack? Maybe not when we're just going on a long trip. Maybe when we're just going out the door for every day. What are some things we might put in our, our backpack, huh? Maybe like things like kindness. That's a good thing. I'd pack that. How about some courage? That's a good one. Doesn't take too much space, right? Oh, here's another good one. How about you put this in your backpack? How about some trust? I think those are three good things you can put in your backpack, right? What are those things exactly? So kindness, right? We know that what that means. That means you're gonna be friendly and helpful, giving to others, you know, you're not really expecting anything in return. You're just, you're just being kind. That's a wonderful thing to keep in your backpack. Ooh, what about this one? Courage. That's a neat word. I like it a lot. This one's, this one can be hard. Courage means to have the strength to do something even when it makes you super scared. That can be kind of hard, but it's a good thing to pack with you. Well, and this is another one that's kind of hard sometimes to understand, but trust. What is trust? You trust people. I bet you have people in your life that you trust. To trust someone means to have faith in them, to know that they will keep their promises to you. It's a wonderful thing to have, and I'm sure you have people in your life that you can trust. So our story today is the story of Rebecca and Isaac. We're continuing on our story. We had Last week, we talked about how Sarah and Abraham had, um, God had promised them a child, and God fulfilled his promise, and um, Sarah had a son named Isaac. And this story fast forwards many years, um, well, several years, right? So when Isaac becomes an adult, and unfortunately Sarah had passed away, and 
um, Isaac, it's time for him to find someone uh, to be his partner to get married. And we're going to read about that today and all these qualities that Rebecca had with her. This story, Rebecca and Isaac, I'm going to put this up here so you can see it. When Abraham and Sarah's son Isaac grew up, Abraham knew it was time for Isaac to get married. Abraham went to his chief servant. Go to my homeland, Abraham said. Find a wife for my son Isaac. The servant took the camels and traveled a long way to find Abraham's people. After a long journey to Abraham's homeland, the servant stopped by a well and prayed, God, help me find a wife for Isaac. If a woman offers a drink of water to me and to my camels, let her be the one. Just then, a woman named Rebecca came to the well. She offered water to Abraham's servant and to his camels. The servant knew Rebecca would become Isaac's wife. The servant asked Rebecca and her family if she would marry Isaac. They said, yes. Rebecca traveled back with Abraham's servant. Soon, Isaac and Rebecca got married and God blessed them. So that's an interesting story because, you know, most of us don't think about uh, marrying someone we've never met, right? So things like, you know, different cultures that happens and in biblical times, obviously it happened in the story. And Rebecca showed a lot of different qualities in this story. One, she was kind. She offered water to Abraham's servant and his camels. That was something he was looking for. Show me the woman who is kind. She showed trust or courage rather. You know, it's kind of a, that was a big ask for her <laughs> and her family. Would you come and marry Isaac? And she said, I will. I'm sure it was scary. That was a scary decision for her to make. But she had trust. She had trust in God's plan for her. And that's what this story tells us today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to travel with kindness, courage, and trust in our hearts every day, no matter if we go far or even if we don't leave our house. Help us remember your plan for us and always have trust in you. Amen. Our middle pin is 2162 Grace Alone. Every promise we can make, every prayer and step. Praise 
is only by His grace. Grace alone, which God supplies, strength unknown, He will provide. Christ in us, our cornerstone, we will go forth in grace alone. We will go in grace alone. In grace alone, we go to God with all of the many things that linger on our hearts that, that just have no place else to go. This morning, as we gather in prayer, we think of those in our community who are hospitalized or have newly entered nursing homes. We think of those who are recovering from new or more recent diagnoses or from medical issues. We think of those who are fighting cancer and other medical problems that are lingering or ongoing. We think of those in our community who are grieving this day. And beyond our community, we think of those who are still fighting those fires in the West. This is an ongoing issue. We've been praying, praying for those who, whose communities have been destroyed by them, for those firefighters who are fighting these fires. It's been weeks now and they must be exhausted. And those who have lost everything must be devastated. And so we pray for, for them. We pray for those who continue to clean up from hurricane recover, from hurricane devastation in the South. Louisiana and Florida as we think about the, them specifically. So, um, so lots to be in prayer for in our community, in our country, and we know that there are, there are things that, that just happen in our lives that, that we haven't told anyone yet. So let's take all of these things to our God in a time of silent prayer, and then I will lead us in a pastoral prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, who is our way, we celebrate, celebrate that you have given us life to live, even if it isn't the way that we would choose life to be right now. You have cared enough to give us air to breathe and people who love us and people for us to love. Thank you for creating us in the first place to know love and to know relationships, to experience unconditional love from you and to be able to share that love with others we meet. In Christ, we have experienced that love in unimaginable ways. Help us to share that love with others, especially those we know who are grieving, who are hurting, who are sick, who are feeling hopeless, who are feeling the effects of addiction, who are wondering if they will ever find a job again, who are wondering where their next meal will come from, or if there will ever be a stable roof over their heads again, who are wondering if the world will ever see them as real people. You have called us to serve you in ways that are tangible on this earth, and sometimes we get so caught up in collecting for ourselves that we forget that your desire is for us to share. Help us to hear the call directly from you to help those who need it even if it's just to listen and offer support. As we look forward to the future you give us, we really don't know what that looks like. What with climate change, racial disparity, and an upcoming election, there's so much that feels so big right now. It feels like we are on a precipice of something monumental. 
reassure us with your presence that no matter what happens, you are with us. No matter what happens, your voice calling for justice will be heard. No matter what happens, you still are God. In that truth, we will stand forever, no matter the future. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. so grateful to everyone who brought items for pads and for a safe place last weekend. We are grateful for everyone who continues to send an offering uh, for the regular uh, general fund. We're grateful for those who have given a special offering this morning for World Communion Sunday, for those who continue to send a missions offering, for, for those who give to trustees projects, for whatever it is, for those who continue to, to spend part of their time in prayer for the life of the church, for those who show up and, and um, help put the, the gardens to bed last weekend, spent some of their time in service. 
Uh, so much time and money and effort goes into not only making our church happen, but in serving, ha having our church serve people in the name of Jesus Christ. And so we are grateful for, for all of those gifts. And let us now uh, go to God to dedicate those gifts. Let us pray. Oh, Jesus, our rock, we thank you for giving us a firm foundation on which to build our future. Out of our obedience to your call in our lives, we share what you have first given us so that others will experience your grace too. Multiply what we give through financial gifts, through service, through our prayers, through the ways we show up for one another, and through the ways we tell your story so that your kingdom will grow in bountiful ways. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We ask for understanding. So much of our lives, wonderful counselor, we think we can do it ourselves. Once we learn how to walk and talk, we think we are fine on our own. As we come back to a review of some basic life skills that you give us, we ask that you would guide our hearing and understanding of your word so that we might be better disciples of your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And today's reading is from Philippians 3 verses 4 through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be precious in your hearing this day. Amen. So if we were to start to brainstorm what we know about Paul, not that we would shout anything out right now because, well, I couldn't hear you anyway, but, but if we were... Some of the things that might pop into your minds would be that he wrote a lot of letters, that he's a leader of the Christian church, at which point a different one of you inevitably, inevitably would pop in and say, but not always. He hasn't always been a good Christian man. Don't forget. Because in his previous life, remember, he was a persecutor of Christians. And not just any old persecutor, but he was the worst of the worst. No Christian wanted to see him coming around. They all knew what it meant when Saul showed up. And then, and then one of you would likely remember something about his unlikely conversion story and how he couldn't see for three days. And then some guy, because who of you would remember Ananias' name? Let's be real. Some guy came and prayed and laid his hands on Saul, and then scales fell from his eyes, and Saul was baptized. 
And then, and then you tell me that that was when his name changed from Saul to Paul. And then I tell you to go back and read your Bibles from Acts chapter 9 to 13, because that's not quite how it happens. That's just the part of the story we've turned into where his name change happens. So I'd make you go back and reread that part. But I digress. At this point, we've gotten enough of the story for me to have a jumping off point from our brainstorming session. Aren't you so glad that you participated in that with me? Because someone, if not most of you, would have remembered that Paul's past is filled with all of this horrible stuff. He's the leader of the persecutors of the Christians. He was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison, it tells us in Acts 8.3. Lovely guy, huh? Great one to have around. Saul's job was actually destroying the church, and he was proud of it at the time. Like, he bragged to his friends how great he was at this job. Of course, things changed for him, and he had this encounter with Jesus, and then Ananias, and he was baptized, and then he started trying to convert people to Christianity. I imagine it was probably a bit of a hard sell for the first few people he met. Well, wasn't this the guy who was just going into the homes of Christians and torturing them? Now he wants to think that this stuff is true? And worse yet, he wants us to think it? Is this some kind of trick? What's going on with this guy? But he's able to move on, and he's a convincing guy, so people come to believe him about Jesus, and the church grows under his leadership. Churches start, and they grow because of his encouragement, and people really look to him to understand things that they didn't used to know. He recounts some of his credentials in the part of this letter to the Philippians that, that Heidi read for us today. As this particular passage starts out, we hear something that makes us think that Paul might be, well, too big for his britches, as the old saying goes. He starts in about what a great disciple he is, like how he's at the top in all of these categories. He was circumcised on the correct day. He was an Israelite. He was part of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee, so he was a leader of the Israelites. He was zealous enough to persecute those who disagreed with Israel, and he was blameless in all of it. Basically, he's saying that he had all of the right Jewish credentials. He had all of the things going for him. All signs pointed to yes for Paul to live as this great leader in the Israelite society of his day. He had it made. But then he goes on. He says that none of these things matter. The moment of his encounter with Jesus all of these things that marked his status in the world were thrown out the window because of Jesus Christ. The only thing that mattered anymore was Jesus and what Jesus wanted Paul to do. Paul has given up all status markers outside Christ, and he may even subtly be suggesting that the Philippians, citizens of a Roman colony, not exploit their privileges of Roman citizenship, but also find true status in Christ. In light of the new identity in Christ, national identities are relativized, as Paul's was. Paul does not renounce his past, and he does not ask the Philippians to renounce theirs. Paul, however, renounces the, his, his past as the defining marker of who he is. The living, invading presence of the risen Christ has turned the tables on this static, death-dealing markers of status. The Christ who would not exploit his status is the true ruler and true status symbol. So whatever the past is, it doesn't matter. Whatever our current reality is, it doesn't matter. Paul is saying it doesn't matter if we're American, Canadian, or Saudi Arabian. When we come to know Jesus, all of that is laid aside so that we can look 
into a better future. We can look into something greater than what we've known before. And, and then here, here is the moment where I always have to remind everyone that just because we come to be followers of Jesus does not mean that our lives will be full of roses and love. We will have heartbreaks and people we love will be diagnosed with diseases that they have to battle and even some they can't beat. So it isn't like following Jesus is this magic pill that makes all of your worries go away. But, but we do have someone who can walk with us, who has been through struggles, struggles worse than our own. Remember the crucifixion story, friends? Jesus has been through struggles. We get, we get a faith community who will show up with food or lawn signs as a reminder of the love we share in Jesus. Just depends on whether we're in the middle of a pandemic or not. Food, lawn signs, you know, you get what you get, right? Following Jesus isn't a magic pill, but it isn't nothing either. Right? It's more than nothing. Because we have something that we wouldn't have had at all without this community of faith. And Paul actually says that too. The end of our passage, he makes this confession. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I love the way Heidi emphasized that for us. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. He knows he hasn't reached the end. He doesn't have the prize. He can't keep looking backward, right? He can't keep looking backward to what he used to have, or he won't obtain the goal that he wants. And the goal he wants is an eternity with Christ. So he keeps looking forward, pressing on or moving into the future where the Holy Spirit is calling. Jill Cranshaw writes, Paul encourages the believers at Philippi to hold on to and live out core Christian values. The primary goal of faith in Paul's view is to know or experience Christ. Communal life is to be centered on attaining this ultimate prize. None of the identity markers that say we are people of faith is more important than a community's heart-centered desire to know and be like Christ. In this current time, friends, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to define what it means to be the United Methodist Church of Antioch. Because all of the old ways are so difficult to maintain, right? Nothing feels quite like it used to. But all this means is that we have a moment to evaluate and decide what it is we want to keep, what it is that we choose to keep moving ahead. We can decide what we're missing, what we're lacking, what we need to add in, and then where some reshuffling needs to happen to make sure that our volunteer efforts are deployed in the right places to meet the needs that we see in the world. We have this opportunity in front of us because when we come back, it will all be different and we can decide how we want that to go. We can hear how God is calling us to move forward. But to do that, we have to keep looking forward. We can't get caught up in the nostalgia of everything was better in the past, even if that past was only six months ago. What we have are the moments in front of us, and we need to make the most of what we have. Working together for the goal of making it our own because Jesus has already made us his own, well, that's something worth working toward. So let's look forward into our future together. And let's see what Christ, what Christ has in store for us. 
And then my friends, let's go there together. Amen. The church is one foundation in Jesus Christ our Lord. We are his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought us that we might ever be his living servant people by his own death set. We go forth with blessing. We go from this worship service into our future, excited about what God has in store for us. We will keep looking forward, working to make the future into the kingdom of God, leaving behind all that doesn't serve God's purpose. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And also with you. Amen.